What is nature and nurture? What you will learn to do. Explain how nature, nurture and epigenetics influence personality and behavior. How do we become who we are? Welcome to Life and Sharing Channel. Traditionally, people's answers have placed them in one of two camps, nature or nurture. One says that genes determine an individual while the other says the environment is the linchpin of development. Since the 16th century, when the terms nature and nurture were first used, many people have spent a lot of time debating what is more important, but these discussions have more often led to dead ends. Ideological rather than heights of insight. New research in epigenetics the science of how the environment influences gene expression is changing the conversation. As psychologist David S. Moore explains in his latest book, The Developing Genome, this burgeoning field reveals that what matters isn't so much what genes you have as what your genes do. And what your genes do is influenced by the ever-changing environment they find themselves in. Factors like stress, nutrition, and exposure to toxins all play a role in how genes are expressed essentially which genes are turned on or off. Unlike the static view of nature or education, epigenetic research demonstrates how genes and environments continually interact to produce characteristics throughout life. The Nature versus Nurture Debate Are you as you are because you were born that way or because of the way you were raised? Do your genetics and biology dictate your personality and behavior, or is it your environment and how you were raised? These questions are at the heart of the centuries-old debate on nature. No other issue in the history of psychology has sparked so much controversy and offense. We are so concerned with nature nurturing because our very sense of moral character seems to depend on it. While we may admire the athletic skills of a great basketball player, we see his height as just a gift, a reward in the genetic lottery. For the same reason, no one blames a short person for their height or someone's congenital inability to make bad decisions. To say the obvious, it is not their fault. But we commend the concert violinist, and maybe her parents and teachers too, for her dedication, just as we condemn cheaters, slackers and bullies for their bad behavior. The problem is, most human characteristics are usually not as clear as the pitch or mastery of the instruments, affirming our nature strongly feeding expectations in one way or another. In fact, even the great violinist can have innate qualities perfect sound or long, nimble fingers that support and reward her hard work. And the basketball player may have eaten a diet while growing up that favored his genetic tendency to be tall. When we think of our own qualities, they seem to be in our control in some ways, but out of our control in others. And often the traits that don't seem to have an obvious cause are the ones that concern us the most and that are much more personally meaningful. And how much do we drink or worry? What about our honesty, our religiosity, or our sexual orientation? They all come from this uncertain zone, neither fixed by nature nor totally under our control. A major problem in answering questions of nature about people is how to organize an experience? In non-human animals, there are relatively simple experiments to address questions of nature. Say, for example, that you are interested in aggression in dogs. You want to test for the most important determinant of aggression, being born to or raised by aggressive dogs. You can mate two aggressive dogs angry chihuahuas together and mate two non-aggressive dogs happy beagles together, then swap half the puppies of each litter between the different groups of parents to be raised. You would then have puppies born to aggressive parents, chihuahuas, but raised by non-aggressive parents, beagles, and vice versa, in litters that are reflected in the distribution of the puppies. The big questions are, would chihuahua parents breed aggressive beagle puppies? Would beagle parents raise non-aggressive chihuahua puppies? Would the nature of puppies prevail, no matter who raised them? Or, would the result be a combination of nature and culture? Most of the most important nature research has been done in this way, Scott and Fuller, 1998, and animal breeders have been doing it successfully for thousands of years. In fact, it is quite easy to breed animals for behavioral traits. With people however, we cannot randomly assign babies to parents, or select parents with certain behavioral characteristics to mate, simply for the sake of science, 
although history contains horrific examples of such practices in misguided attempts at eugenics, shaping human characteristics through intentional reproduction. In typical human families, the biological parents of children are raising them, so it is very difficult to know whether children act like their parents for genetic, nature, or environmental nurture reasons. Nonetheless, despite our restrictions on setting up human-based experiments, we see concrete examples of the cultivation of nature at work in the human realm, although they only provide partial answers to our questions. Many questions. The science of how genes and environments work together to influence behavior is called behavioral genetics. The simplest opportunity we have to observe this is the adoption study. When children are put up for adoption, the parents who give birth to them are no longer the parents who raise them. This setup is not quite the same as experiments with dogs, children are not assigned to random adoptive parents in order to cater for a scientist's special interests, but adoption still tells us some interesting things. Or at least confirms some basic expectations. For example, if the biological child of grandparents were adopted into a small family, do you think the child's growth would be affected? What about the biological child of a Spanish-speaking family adopted at birth into an English-speaking family? What language would you expect the child to speak? And what can these results tell you about the difference between height and language in terms of nature-nurture? Another option for observing nature feeding in humans involves twin studies. There are two types of twins, monozygous, MZ, and dizygotic, DZ. Monozygotic twins, also called identical twins, come from a single zygote, fertilized egg, and have the same DNA. They are basically clones. Dizygotic twins, also called fraternal twins, develop from two zygotes and share 50% of their DNA. Fraternal twins are ordinary siblings who were born at the same time. To analyze nature feeding using twins, we compare the similarity of the MZ and DZ pairs. Focusing on the characteristics of height and spoken language, let's see how nature and upbringing apply. Identical twins, unsurprisingly, are almost perfectly similar for height. The sizes of fraternal twins, however, are like all other sibling pairs, more similar to each other than people from other families, but hardly identical. This contrast between twin types gives us a clue about the role genetics play in determining height. Now consider the spoken language. If an identical twin speaks Spanish at home, the coat when she grew up with almost certainly does too. But so would a pair of fraternal twins raised together. In terms of spoken language, fraternal twins are just as similar as identical twins, so it seems that the genetic match of identical twins doesn't make much of a difference. Twin and adoption studies are two examples of a much larger class of methods of observing nurturing nature called quantitative genetics, the scientific discipline in which similarities between individuals are analyzed based on their biological relationship. We can do these studies with siblings and half-brothers, cousins, twins who were separated at birth and raised separately, Bouchard, Lucan, McGew and Siegel, 1990. These twins are very rare and play a less important role than is generally believed in the science of nature feeding or with entire extended families, C. Plumman, DeFries, Nopik and Niederheiser, 2012, for a comprehensive introduction to research methods relevant to nature feeding. For better or worse, controversies over educating nature have intensified because quantitative genetics produces a number called the coefficient of heritability, ranging from 0 to 1, intended to provide a unique measure of influence. Genetics of a trait Generally speaking, a coefficient of heritability measures the strength with which the differences between individuals are related to the differences between their genes. But beware, the heritability coefficients, although simple to calculate, are deceptively difficult to interpret. Nonetheless, numbers which provide simple answers to complex questions tend to have a strong influence on the human imagination, and much time has been spent discussing whether the heritability of intelligence or personality or depression equals one number or another. One of the reasons why nature continues to fascinate us so much is that we live in a time of great scientific discoveries in genetics, comparable to the time of Copernicus, Galileo and Newton as far as astronomy and physics are concerned.
Every day, it seems, new discoveries are made, new possibilities are offered. When Francis Galton began to think about nature nurturing at the end of the 19th century, he was greatly influenced by his cousin, Charles Darwin, but the genetics themselves were unknown. Mendel's famous work on peas, carried out around the same time, remained unknown for 20 years, quantitative genetics were developed in the 1920s, DNA was discovered by Watson and Crick in the 1950s, the human genome was completely sequenced at the turn of the 21st century, and we are now on the verge of being able to obtain anyone's specific DNA sequence at a relatively low cost. No one knows what this new genetic knowledge will mean for the study of nature feeding, but as we will see in the next section, the answers to nature's questions feeding have proven to be much more difficult and mysterious than anyone else imagined it. What have we learned about nature feeding? It would be satisfying if we could say that studies of nature education have provided us with conclusive and comprehensive evidence on the origin of traits, with some traits clearly resulting from genetics and others almost entirely from environmental factors, such as child-rearing practices and personal will, but this is not the case. Instead, everything turned out to have genetics bases. The more genetically related people are, the more alike they look for everything, height, weight, intelligence, personality, mental illness, etc. Of course, it seems logical that some traits have a genetic bias. For example, adopted children look like their birth parents even though they've never met them, and identical twins look more alike than fraternal twins. And if certain psychological traits, such as personality or mental illness, for example, schizophrenia, seem reasonably influenced by genetics, it turns out the same is true of political attitudes, how much people watch television, Plumman, Corley, DeFries and Fulker, 1990, and whether or not they divorce, McGue and Lucan, 1992. It may seem surprising, but the genetic influence on behavior is a relatively recent discovery. By the mid-20th century, psychology was dominated by the doctrine of behaviorism, which held that behavior could only be explained in terms of environmental factors. For example, smooth chin is a recessive trait, which means that an individual will display the smooth chin phenotype only if they are homozygous for that recessive allele BB. Psychiatry has focused on psychoanalysis, which probed the roots of behavior in the early life stories of individuals. The truth is that neither behaviorism nor psychoanalysis is incompatible with genetic influences on behavior, and neither Freud nor Skinner were naive about the importance of organic processes in behavior. Nonetheless, in their day it was widely believed that children's personalities were shaped entirely by mimicking their parents' behavior, and that schizophrenia was caused by certain types of pathological mothering. Regardless of the outcome of our larger nature-nurturing discussion, the fundamental fact that the best predictors of an adopted child's personality or mental health are found in the biological parents they have never met. Rather than in the adoptive parents who raised him or her, presents a significant challenge to purely environmental explanations of personality or psychopathology. The message is clear, you can't leave genes out of the equation. But keep in mind that no behavior trait is completely inherited, so you can't leave the environment behind either. Trying to disentangle the various ways in which the culture of nature influences human behavior can be complicated, and often common sense can undermine good science. It can be very helpful to keep in mind a very significant contribution from behavioral genetics that changed psychology for good, when your subjects are biologically related, no matter how clear a situation may seem to indicate an environmental influence, it does not. It is never sure to interpret. Behavior is entirely the result of education without further evidence. For example, when presented with data showing that children whose mothers read to them often are likely to have better reading scores in third grade, it is tempting to conclude that reading aloud to your children is important. To be successful in school, this may well be true, but the study as described is inconclusive, as there are genetic and environmental pathways between the parenting practices of mothers and the abilities of their children. This is a case where correlation does not imply causation, as they say. To establish that reading aloud is the cause of success, a scientist can either study the problem in adoptive families, in which the genetic pathway is absent, or find a way to randomly assign children to reading conditions. 
Psychological researchers study genetics in order to better understand the biological basis that contributes to certain behaviors. Although all humans share certain biological mechanisms, each of us is unique. And while our bodies have many of the same parts the brain, hormones, and cells with genetic codes these are expressed in a wide variety of behaviors, thoughts, and reactions. Why do two people infected with the same disease have different outcomes, one survivor and one dying of the disease? How are genetic diseases transmitted through family lines? Are there genetic components in psychological disorders, such as depression or schizophrenia? To what extent could health problems such as childhood obesity have a psychological basis? To explore these questions, let's start by focusing on a specific disease, sickle cell anemia, and how it might affect two infected sisters. Sickle cell anemia is a genetic disease in which red blood cells, which are normally round, take on a crescent shape, figure 5. The altered form of these cells affects how they work, sickle-shaped cells can clog blood vessels and block blood flow, resulting in high fever, severe pain, swelling, and tissue damage. Many people with sickle cell anemia and the particular genetic mutation that causes it die at an early age. While the notion of survival of the fittest may suggest that people with this disease have a low survival rate and therefore the disease will become less common, it is not. Despite the negative evolutionary effects associated with this genetic mutation, the sickle cell gene remains relatively common in people of African descent. Why is it? The explanation is illustrated by the following scenario. Imagine two young women Louis and Senna sisters in rural Zambia, Africa. Louis carries the sickle cell gene, Senna does not carry the gene. Sickle cell carriers have a copy of the sickle cell gene, but do not have full-blown sickle cell anemia. They only experience symptoms if they are severely dehydrated or deprived of oxygen, as in mountaineering. Carriers are believed to be immune to malaria, an often fatal disease that is prevalent in tropical climates, because changes in their blood chemistry and immune function prevent the malaria parasite from having its effects, Gong, Perique, Rosenthal and Greenhouse, 2013. However, full-fledged sickle cell disease with two copies of the sickle cell gene does not confer immunity to malaria. When walking home from school, the two sisters are bitten by mosquitoes carrying the malaria parasite. Lily doesn't get malaria because she carries the sickle cell mutation. Senna, on the other hand, develops malaria and dies only two weeks later. Louis survives and eventually has children, to whom she can pass the sickle cell mutation. Malaria is rare in the United States, so the sickle cell gene benefits no one, the gene manifests itself primarily in health problems minor in carriers, serious in the disease in its own right with no benefit to carriers. However, the situation is quite different in other parts of the world. In areas of Africa where malaria is prevalent, the sickle cell mutation has health benefits for carriers, protection against malaria. This is precisely the situation Charles Darwin describes in The Theory of Evolution by Natural Selection. Simply put, the theory states that organisms that are better suited to their environment will survive and reproduce, while those that are poorly adapted to their environment will die. This is precisely the situation Charles Darwin describes in The Theory of Evolution by Natural Selection. Simply put, the theory states that organisms that are better suited to their environment will survive and reproduce, while those that are poorly adapted to their environment will die. Two Perspectives on Genetics and Behavior Two areas that study the interplay of genes and the environment, such as the areas of evolutionary psychology and behavioral genetics, are easy to be wrong. How can we tell them apart? In both fields, it is understood that genes not only code for particular traits, but also contribute to certain patterns of cognition and behavior. Evolutionary psychology focuses on how universal patterns of behavior and cognitive processes have evolved over time. Therefore, variations in cognition and behavior would make individuals more or less successful in reproducing and passing on these genes to their offspring. Evolutionary psychologists study a variety of psychological phenomena that may have evolved as adaptations, including fear response, food preferences, mate selection, and cooperative behaviors, confer ETAL, 2010. 
While evolutionary psychologists focus on universal patterns that have evolved over millions of years, behavioral geneticists study how individual differences arise in the present through the interaction of genes and the environment. When studying human behavior, behavioral geneticists often use twin and adoption studies to research questions of interest. Twin studies compare the rates of sharing a given behavioral trait between identical and fraternal twins, Adoption studies compare these rates among biologically related parents and adoptive parents. Both approaches provide insight into the relative importance of genes and the environment for the expression of a given trait. Genetic variation. Genetic variation, the genetic difference between individuals, is what helps a species adapt to its environment. In humans, genetic variation begins with an egg, around 100 million sperm, and fertilization. Fertile women ovulate about once a month, releasing an egg from the follicles in the ovary. The egg travels through the fallopian tube from the ovary to the uterus, where it can be fertilized by sperm. The egg and sperm each contain 23 chromosomes. Chromosomes are long chains of genetic material called deoxyribonucleic acid, DNA. DNA is a helix-shaped molecule made up of nucleotide base pairs. Within each chromosome, DNA sequences make up genes that control or partially control a number of visible characteristics called traits, such as eye color, hair color, etc. A single gene can have several possible variations or alleles. An allele is a specific version of a gene. Thus, a given gene can code for the hair color trait, and the different alleles of that gene affect the hair color of an individual. When a sperm and an egg merge, their 23 chromosomes combine and create a zygote with 23 pairs of chromosomes. Therefore, each parent provides half of the genetic information carried by the offspring, the resulting physical characteristics of the offspring, called the phenotype, are determined by the interaction of genetic material provided by the parents, called the genotype. The genotype of a person is the genetic makeup of that person. The phenotype, on the other hand, refers to the physical characteristics inherited from the individual. Most traits are controlled by multiple genes, but some traits are controlled by one gene. A characteristic like chin slit, for example, is influenced by a single gene from each parent. In this example, we will call the cleft chin gene B and the smooth chin gene B. Chin cleft is a dominant trait, meaning that having the dominant allele from one parent, BB, or both parents, BB, will always result in the phenotype associated with the dominant allele. When a person has two copies of the same allele, they are said to be homozygous for that allele. When a person has a combination of alleles for a given gene, they are said to be heterozygous. For example, smooth chin is a recessive trait, which means that an individual will display the smooth chin phenotype only if they are homozygous for that recessive allele, BB. Imagine a woman with a split chin had a child with a man with a smooth chin. What type of chin will her child have? The answer to this depends on the alleles each parent carries. If the woman is homozygous for a chin cleft, BB, her offspring will always have a chin cleft. However, it becomes a bit more complicated if the mother is heterozygous for this gene, BB. Since the sire has a smooth chin hence homozygous for the recessive allele, BB, we can expect the offspring to have a 50% chance of having a split chin and a 50% chance of having a chin. Sickle cell disease is just one of many genetic disorders caused by the pairing of two recessive genes. For example, phenylketonuria, PKU, is a condition in which individuals lack an enzyme that normally converts harmful amino acids into harmless byproducts. If a person with this condition is not treated, they will experience significant deficits in cognitive function seizures and an increased risk of various psychiatric disorders. Because PKU is a recessive trait, each parent must have at least one copy of the recessive allele in order to produce a child with the disease. So far we have discussed traits that involve a single gene, but few human characteristics are controlled by a single gene. Most traits are polygenic, controlled by more than one gene. Height is an example of a polygenic trait, as is skin color and weight. Where do the harmful genes that contribute to diseases like PKU come from? 
Gene mutations provide a source of harmful genes. A mutation is a sudden, permanent change in a gene. While many mutations can be harmful or fatal, every once in a while a mutation benefits an individual by giving them an advantage over those who do not carry the mutation. Recall that the theory of evolution asserts that individuals best suited to their particular environment are more likely to reproduce and pass their genes on to future generations. For this process to occur, there must be competition more technically, there must be variability in genes and resulting traits that allow variation in adaptability to the environment. If a population were made up of identical individuals, any drastic change in the environment would affect everyone equally and there would be no variation in selection. On the other hand, the diversity of genes and associated traits allows some individuals to perform slightly better than others in the face of environmental changes. This creates a distinct advantage for those individuals best suited to their environment in terms of successful reproduction and genetic transmission.